Okay, wait a minute. Okay, boom, perfect. And we are live. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to a very special edition of the People's Podcast this afternoon or this evening. We have an incredible guest with us who's here to give us some information as well as some inspiration on an amazing uh, topic, a very um, you know popular topic, and that is none other than Dr. Henry M. Carter. First of all, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing well, brother. Thank you for having me on the show. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It means a lot that you would take time to come on the show. Um, the first question we want to know is, so the, the segment whenever we do television or film series is binge or cringe. Is the television show uh, binge worthy or is it cringe worthy, uh, The Godfather of Harlem, in your opinion? It is a binge worthy show. I mean, it has so many authentic elements in it uh, that I think that everyone would get an entertaining and educational experience out of viewing the show. Okay, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wonderful, wonderful. Hold on. Um, hold on. Okay, perfect. Thank, I'm thanking everyone who's watching, thanking everyone who always showing love. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yes, sir. And and Dr. Carter, what is the uh, your favorite show? I mean, your favorite character on the show? Well, I think uh, Bumpy has, of course, be the uh, one of the favorite characters, but I also believe that uh, Thatcher, who's playing the role of uh, Malcolm X, is uh, point on in the mannerism and the behaviors of uh, Brother Malcolm as well. Uh, I think he really captured the spirit of, because this is not his first time playing that role of Malcolm X. He played it once before in a story with about Martin Luther King, but he had a very small role and they just recast him for this role. Mm. Okay, yes, sir. And what do you think about um, the Muhammad Ali? How do you feel about how do you, how do you portray him? Well, I think he they did they were very balanced with the whole Muhammad Ali thing in regards to bringing him in and find sharing how he got introduced to Islam. Uh, you know, you 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 if you marry that with the uh, movie that One Night in Miami, where you kind of see the pieces of how Muhammad Ali was coming into the knowledge of self and learning and kind of being uh, mentored. Now, in this show, they got him mentored by Malcolm X. Of course, there's been a, a whole array of people who gave some mentorship uh, to Muhammad Ali, even our beloved brother Abdul, uh, 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 brother Rahman, yes, uh, had yes, opportunity to be involved in uh, dropping some seeds on, on Muhammad Ali. But I think that it shows the, uh, the, the torn, Muhammad Ali was torn. He was torn between this mentor of his, uh, of Malcolm X, and torn between his loyalty and dedication to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I mean, and so, you know, it put him in a very uh, sensitive spot because how do you turn on a man who introduced this to you or nurtured you, but then you you get that you're dealing with the messenger of God yes. at the same time. <laughs> so I can imagine, well, uh, you know, how, how he felt uh, going between two people that he had so much love for. Okay, great, great. Yes, sir. What about the mafia? The mafia, you know, they were point on. A lot of the story, there's one thing I like about the writers on The Godfather of Harlem, they did their research in regards to capturing what really happened in Harlem around that time and what was going on in, in, in real life in regards to the mafia being involved in the uh, heroin connection and how they controlled uh, that in, in Harlem and how uh, they were pretty much had their hands into all of the businesses in the black community. But also it talked a little bit about the contention between the families that were going on. And that was very, that was very uh, good that they were showing that backdrop that the families had tension, which really ushered in an opportunity for Bumpy to be able to position himself because Bumpy has always been a master in pitting the mafia against each other because he knew about the divisions that went on among the family and they bring that out in, in, in the Godfather of Harlem. Okay, yes sir, they do. Now speaking, and thank everybody who's watching. And yes sir, uh, Mr. Jason uh, Walls, I, I understand your view. Thank you for watching. Um, what about the daughter, the last, on the last episode when they showed the daughter 
picking up the phone and now saying that she's going to like basically she's an informant uh, for the FBI. What do you think about that? Well, you know, uh, Benjamin Franklin said that only way three three people can keep a secret, two of them got to be dead, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and that that element always exists in the family. I mean, there's always someone within the organization that shares information with uh, the government agency. That's the only way that the government agencies were affected through a COINTEL pro, the counterintelligence program. They had to have people who were on the inside or willing to work on the inside to give vital information. And it also goes to show you a war about a woman's scorn. You know, when a woman, when you go a foot of a woman, and that's what the daddy did, he, he broke her heart, right? And when that happens, uh, the question is, do the affairs of the heart trump family ties? And what you're saying is that I can't get back at my father. This is a powerful gangster. I can't go up there, but I can get at him in another way. And that's what we're seeing right now is a person acting out of the, the love against a father who took something away from her that she feel that can't be replaced. And so uh, that went on all the time uh, within, within the uh, organized crime family. Mm, okay, yes, sir, I didn't know that. Also, um, there's a, here's a suggestion right here, I don't know if you have um, Hulu or not, but there's a, a television documentary called MLK slash FBI, and mm -hmm. it's new, and it came out like, like a month ago, but it's dealing with what you're saying with the COINTEL, but it's dealing with so much more, so much more detail, and just show how the government um, was a man. They treated Malcolm X. I mean, Martin Luther King the way they treated Malcolm X. <laughs> they treated him the same, um, and they definitely had agents and people around informants who were around Martin Luther King the whole time. I didn't know that. Um, um, thank you, Mimi, for coming late. Mimi said something like a brand. I mean, Dr. Carter. Well, uh, boom. Okay. My next question for you is the black mother of the boy who was killed. Um, by the by, the you know the mafia, mm -hmm. when she when she um, accepted the the role to leave town, do you think that was a good decision? Do you think she's gonna come back, or what do you think is gonna happen with that? I think uh, she made absolutely the correct uh, decision. Uh, in real life, in real life, uh, she would have been killed. Mm -hmm. There would have been any money given to her. She's a loose string, and organized crime prides itself on not leaving loose strings. And then she was a mother who lost a child. And so uh, she was a, she's a liability, even to the guy, you know, the guy that's in the, in, the, in, the, in the TV series that gave her the money. He put his life in jeopardy and when any made man was gonna put their life in jeopardy for a black person at that time. So that was a little bit of creative liberty, but for the sake of the show, she made the best decision to be able to take that money and to leave town because from a psychological perspective, uh, being in a, in a city where your son got killed and to see these people still around uh, in real life would just been tremendously devastating. So I think for her to get that money and get a fresh start somewhere else was, a, you know, for that character was a part of her healing process. Beautiful, yes, sir. And thank you, uh, Mimi, uh, for your comments about the binge work. This is, uh, she's talking about, beautiful. Um, next. Um, the character Chase, who or, who watched his girlfriend, you know, he stood up in the um, the Geechee house or the Geechee place, and he stood up for her. He didn't. He did. He did the opposite. He didn't leave town, uh -huh. and then he wound up uh, uh, paying for that. How? What do you think about his decision not to leave town? Should he have left town, or how do you think? What do you think should have happened there? I think he compromised the organization. Uh, mm -hmm. I think he compromised uh, uh, Bumpy's credibility. And then he also showed that uh, there's some insubordination uh, going on uh, because he was given an order by Bumpy uh, and he, he defied that order. Uh, Lieutenant for Bumpy, not the other guy that the, the, the girlfriend got killed. They kind of portray it like he's really the, 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 the main guy that, for Bumpy, but it's really Pettigrew. Pettigrew was a real person who was Bumpy's right hand man. Mm, mm. Okay, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now let's let's talk about I mean my sister Miriam says excellent point. I mean excellent acting and excellent score for the show. Wonderful. Let's talk about Adam Clayton Powell, sir. How do you think that he's uh uh portrayed and, and how do you how important is his character to uh the film and in in history as well? 
I think the the casting is phenomenal. Uh, you know, Adam Clayton Powell being one of my fraternity brothers, I have to <laughs> add that in. He was a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Yes, sir. Uh, but he was a linchpin uh, in that community. When you think about the balance of Malcolm X in that community, you think about the balance of Adam Clayton Powell, you think about uh, Bumpy Johnson, they were all necessary elements in Harlem at that time. It created a balance. Uh, there wasn't a Martin Luther King figure other than Adam Clayton Powell in Harlem. He was the Martin Luther King mixed with a Malcolm X and a little bit of Bumpy Johnson. He was that person that encompassed all of them because he had to find a way to, 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 to uh, lay with the lines and dine with the king. And so they are spot on. Now, people would say, what about his uh, dubious lifestyle of being a preacher and then having this secular life. Well, that's 80% of, of men of God. <laughs> you know, nobody came down from heaven. Everybody came up from a hell of a condition, right? Yes, and so, we, so Adam was a master. Matter of fact, he was a political genius mm. in his ability to have a balance between the religious community, the political community, the, the black, uh, power movement and to also have a balance in between the Christian community. Uh, that's why he's favored in history. And a lot of times you hear a little bit about his indiscretions, but they don't uh, amplify it because he played a vital role in balancing out Har uh, Harlem at that time, just like Bumpy, Malcolm and other uh, organizations. Wonderful. Yes, sir. Why, this is my, why I've learned about Adam Clayton Powell in history. Uh, but not in this in-depth, uh, you know, study. I'm like, so this is, so I'm, I feel like I'm getting introduced to a new person. And like, I'm like, okay, this is the man they told us about. Well, but uh, well, Dr. Carter, how much of indiscretion, does indiscretions matter in the big scheme of things? Like, does that matter? Well, you know what, you know, uh, none, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so, you know, there's always uh, uh, different uh, standards, uh, societal norms uh, that occur. Uh, but I don't think that you have to look at the behavior of a person in discretion and ex uh, excuse them from the indiscretion. Uh, but you don't have to use that as a reason why they can't be valuable in the community. Yes, there speaks to some moral values that we need to look at. But if you're looking for a perfect person, uh, then you're going to be disappointed all the time. And I think that's what a lot of us have uh, made a mistake when we look at leadership. We're looking at someone that we feel that should not make any mistake. But, you know, as the minister told us, is that they're in the light. And so you can see all of their indiscretion while you're doing the same thing in the dark because nobody knows who you are. And so we have to be very uh, careful in our judgment of the indiscretion. Uh, because what they add for the bigger picture and the, and the greater movement is more important than the indiscretion. Wonderful. Yes, sir. What do you think about uh, the women in the uh, on the television show, uh, specifically the um, very, um, I just think she's my favorite character almost in the whole show. Not, she is my favorite character in the whole show, Mamie uh, Johnson. What do you think about her? Like, what do you think about the women in the, in the show? They are showing women as very powerful powerful parts of the movement. This is, see, this is what I like about uh, the Godfather of Harlem. It is giving us the backstory that went on. You know, the movement, uh, you know, we know there have always been women who've been involved in the movement and uh, Fannie Lou Hamer and uh, uh, you can, with the list can go on. But when you think about a person like uh, Bumpy Johnson, you would, you know, in today's society, you see gangsters, they, they got women who are of less uh, ladylike qualities <laughs> as, their, as their significant other. But on here, you see that Bumpy has a very loyal, dedicated, intelligent Black woman who it kind of brings a, 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 a balance to Bumpy. She is the one that gives him the conscience. You have to understand, Bumpy at this point has spent at least 25 years of his life in prison. This, he spent one 10 year 
bid, and then he got another 15 year bid from 1951 to 1963. And mm -hmm. this piece picks up in 1963 after he did a 15 year bid, right? And she was dedicated to him and kept him and keeps him balanced. So I think they're doing a phenomenal that even his daughter who started out on the show as a rebellious person on drugs, they showed how she was able to persevere and overcome the challenge of drug addiction and find the knowledge of self. And I mean, it's just phenomenal. There's phenomenal casting on this show, but it's also a phenomenal backstory about the strength of black women on this show. And just women in general, because when you think about uh, the, uh, uh, I'm thinking her name, the, the rich family is excusing me right now, the Vanderbilt woman, the white woman that's in here, she is part of the Vanderbilt yes, one yes, uh, yes, families. Yes, that, that's a the very wealthy family. Well, they even show her strength because at that time, uh, a, a, a person, a, a white person investing in the movement, because we know there was a lot of white philanthropists investing in the movement, uh, that, that's very meaningful to show the strength that she was willing to put forth. So they, they, they have really done a good job in showing women very favorably on this show, in my opinion. Okay, great. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What about uh, the, well, speaking of his daughter, do you think that Bumpy's daughter, um, is she right in being loyal to Malcolm X? Or like, like where, where do you stand on that? Well, you know, you have to understand that uh, people fall in love with the people that they see every day. Uh, you know, uh, there's, you know, we have been fortunate that, uh, you know, the minister always made sure that we understood that the most honorable Elijah Muhammad is the reason that all of us benefited from being resurrected from the dead, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, but, you know, there was always a personality loving thing in any, any organization. And she fell in love with Malcolm because Malcolm became that savior for her. Right. Yes, she is the one that brought her out of the muck and the mire. He was the one that could communicate with her father. So she in on this character is is actually love Malcolm and Mamie brought that out. You know, she, she said, I think you love my husband. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, she loves Malcolm. Uh, she knows of the messenger. But she don't have that relationship that Malcolm and the messenger have. Her relationship is through Malcolm. And the minister said one time they are that the messenger told him, brother, they are my followers if you are my follower, right? Mm -hmm. And so her love for the messenger is directly connected how Malcolm dealt with her, right? And so that's why she was more in love with Malcolm. And he, he, he the character they got Malcolm on here is making her more in love with him by telling her to spy for him inside of the mosque. Instead of telling her, look his sister, you should fall into ranks and let, uh, let Allah handle this. He used her love for him, which separated her from her connection to the messenger. Absolutely. Do you think that she should tell, should she or, and is she gonna tell the daughter that, um, who's, who, that she's the mother? Well, well, the history depicts that it was revealed mm, mm. Uh, uh, at that point. But at this point, it would not be advantageous for her to break up that, 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 that kind of relationship that this young girl has because she needs some stability. She needs some, some balance. But I do believe that this series should begin to connect her more with her daughter in a legitimate way, opposed to being this sister thing because as that young lady gets older, there's going to be a sense of betrayal. And who's to say that she won't be so traumatized for this that she might end up going out into the street and being just like her mother was. So I think it is incumbent upon Bumpy and Mamie to start bridging that gap between the mother and the, the, and the daughter. But I do understand where Mamie is coming from. You still fresh off of your last hit, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> yes. So Mamie is saying, you need to prove to me that I need to introduce her as a daughter, not just no one year or two years. Cause right now this, according to the timeline in the, in the, in the TV series, she's only been clean for a year. 
So that's not enough time to say you have proven yourself because what if this Malcolm is gone? Will she go back to hitting the pipe or what I mean, taking her on? And then the young girl is back at zero where, where she don't even have any stability. Yes, sir. Great points. And what about um, in real life? How, how, how do you think that situation should be handled where people deal with that? Because I was talking to my sister about losing Isaiah. And, you know, these people give the child away and then the mom comes back. How, how should that be handled? Well, you know, the term mama and big mama are terms that originated out of the South. And that happened so many times where mama had to give the child to her mother and that mother received the title of big mama. Uh, and, I, and, and, and even in my family, uh, there's been uh, cousins who my grandparents them had to raise and that became their mother. Now the parents came back later. I can't. I can't hear you, Dr. Carter. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. One second. One second. And thank everyone for their patience while we wait, wait, and continue to figure out it's the television show, The Godfather of Harlem, binge worthy or cringe worthy with Dr. Henry M. Carter. And please let us know what you all think. Um, if you haven't already, let us know. Do you watch the show? All right, we're just waiting on Dr. Carter to tell us. Does anybody has anybody seen the show, The Godfather of Harlem? And you know, what do you all think? Mm -hmm. Let me see if it is one of this. Are we waiting on Dr. Carter to come back with the sound? Um, we're waiting on, we're waiting on Dr. Carter to come back. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. All right. Technology at its best. Yes, sir. But you was breaking down Big Mama's and the origin. Well, Big Mama always filled in and kind of replaced uh, the mother. And when the mother came back later on, uh, that the mother understood that she did not have the legitimate title of mother. Uh, she, uh, uh, Big Mama was the mama, meaning that when Big Mama made the decision, Mama had to defer to whatever Big Mama said because the children had in their mind have seen the grandparents as the parent and it's kind of like somebody coming taking a child out of a family uh after they have been with a, a family for so long uh so rarely unless the child is very young do i advocate that that parent comes back especially if this child is a, a teenager you just can't come back and say well, you can come and stay with me. Now you're gonna to have to start setting up vis visitation rights and develop a relationship with your child. I, I was at a, 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 a training two weeks ago about black men and it was talking about uh, uh, black men who fathers come from prison and the father want to come in and say, you're gonna do what I say. And one of the young men said, he told his father, you got to earn my respect because you ain't been around. You just can't come in and play dad. You got to show me that you are really a dad. And I think that's what a lot of people who drop their children off with somebody else, you just can't come and pick up and say, I'm your mama. No, you got to show this person that you're going to legitimately be my, their mama and respect the process. Mm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What are your uh, thoughts on Betty Shabazz and how she was portrayed? I think, I think they came very close to it. I mean, the history teaches that uh, Sister Betty was very loyal to uh, Brother Malcolm. Uh, we we see that she carried herself. They had her in a, a, a pious and righteous uh, way. Uh, they had her, you know, in the sense that she was supporting Malcolm and the mission and the things he needed to do. I think she just a, she was an MGT that supported her husband. And, uh, you know, she was going to, wherever the, the road led to, she was going to go, you know, and, and 
and and I really I really liked how they carried her character. They really didn't put a lot of life about her. Uh, you can see they only put a lot of scenes because they wanted to keep the emphasis on uh, Malcolm. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. But but I think they did a good job in, in representing Betty Shabazz as well. Okay, great. What are your thoughts on the March on Washington and how, it, as far as it was portrayed, like from that angle of Malcolm X and Adam Clayton Powell going uh, to to Washington, seeing uh, the white supremacists, and I, like how, how? What do you think about that? Well, I think you know uh, Adam, and uh, of course you know he didn't en entirely believe in the turn the other cheek uh, whole entire nonviolence thing. Like I say, <laughs> uh, New York. It has a special uh, chemistry and culture of people being straightforward and uh, they take things a little bit more serious when it comes to being involved in freedom, justice and equality. And so uh, them looking at the March on Washington thought it should be in a, done in a little bit different way. But I don't think any one of them was surprised at what, what, what came about it on that March on Washington. Okay, yes, sir. And, and and what about Adam? I never saw that Adam Clayton Powell felt that he should be able to to speak because of his relationship with the president and things of that nature. Should he was that a slight to him or like or was that real? Or was that what was going on with that? It was absolutely a slight because as I mentioned before, in a, the, the civil rights movement felt that he was uh, too verbal, uh, too radical. Uh, you got to understand the people that were around uh, Martin Luther King, Dr. King, these were individuals who were actually uh, put out there to be a soft and kind of gentler, non-threatening yes, uh, type of a scenario for America to see as a black man. Adam Clayton Powell was the kind of black man that would have came up there and gave a Nation of Islam type of speech. <laughs> and that because of the X factor, the unpredictability of Adam Clayton Powell, they didn't want to take that chance of putting in jeopardy uh, the white and Jewish philanthropists that were supporting uh, the civil rights movement. They, he was just too volatile for them. Yes, sir. That makes sense. And thank you once again to thank everyone who continues to watch the People's Podcast. Um, what do what do you um oh, Naima says teach? What do you think uh predictions that you have coming up for the upcoming season? Well, I mean the upcoming season, because we're gonna move closer and closer. We know uh what occurred uh in regards to the life of uh, Malcolm, they're moving and more into 1964. Uh and we know that how that's gonna play out. Uh but after the uh, Malcolm said, and this is where a lot of people think, well, if the Malcolm element is not there, once again, this is not called Malcolm X of Harlem. This is called, <laughs> <laughs> this is called the Godfather of Harlem, right? This is about Bumpy Johnson life. So people be, for people who say uh, that Malcolm is gone and it ain't gonna be the same if the Malcolm character, well, this is based on real life, right? And so we know that Bumpy uh, didn't die until 1968. So, so after you know the Malcolm uh, leaves the scene, we still have three additional years. Well, uh, Bumpy life, is, is, and he's still running Harlem. And we're gonna start seeing the introduction of other characters like Frank Luca, uh, Lucas. He's gonna come into scene because uh, Frank Lucas took that whole French connection that Bumpy is talking about now yes, about sir. how the drugs came into Harlem. Well, Frank Lucas took that whole French connection over on a global stage, and uh, and the move and the organization would defer to Frank Lucas. So I think we're going to start seeing the Frank Lucas character kick in there, and then we're also going to see the other character that was uh. On uh, on uh, 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 the American gangster, uh, I can't recall his, his name right quick. Uh, the the other little flashy one that Cuba Gooden played. Uh, 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 it, it, I, we're gonna see that character come in play, and the reason I say that character is possibly gonna come in play is because it also shows that as Bumpy got older, there started to be more players coming on the field in Harlem. Uh, trying to be the next Godfather of Harlem. Absolutely, I'm about to Google that, uh, Dr. Carter, because I can't let us not know it. Because that was a like, that was a major point. But yes, sir, I wanted to ask you about. Uh, speaking of that, how do you handle that? Because that's what I deal with a lot. 
a lot of uh, woke or you know conscious people who who feel that they are letting they only see it through the lens of the Malcolm or the Nation standpoint, as opposed, like you said, the the bumpy the, the stories about Bumpy Johnson, not about the nation necessarily. Yeah, and I think you know just to go back, there are some things about the nation. I think that they you know they covered, they covered our culture. Uh, did a brother uh, Henry exist? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, that that spirit exists. Do well, you know? Are we you know stern? But what I do like, and I think the sisters appreciate this. This is one of the few uh, television programs and movies that talk about the nation that got the garment right for the sister. I mean, at least they're about ninety four percent correct. In <laughs> in, the, in the, you know normally they try to put a, a uh, uh, handkerchief on the on the sister head that tied under their chin, <laughs> but now they really they had the sisters in the full garment. Now they did leave out at that time that sisters did have a uh, kind of box type of covering at that time. Uh, yes, that would have been a little bit more authentic uh, in it. You know, my mother and father they came through. My mother father in law came through the nation uh, as well, and so when I look at the peer the pictures at that time, I see. The different dress, but I I think they covered uh, certain elements of the nation uh, very good, very good. Yes, sir, excellent. I just wish they had somebody who was like Mamie Johnson, but like in the garment that would be like perfect. And I was like, all right. But anyway, uh, the Nikki Nikki Barnes, Doctor Carter, Nikki Barnes. That's who I'm yeah. thinking about. Yes, yeah, that exactly. Nikki Barnes character. I think he's going to be uh, come up and be loosely mentioned because they're going to have to start sharing the transition. Now, let me go back a little bit. I want to share this is who, how did this bumpy come into existence, right? Hmm. You know, uh, Stephanie St. Clair, they call her Madam St. Clair. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. She ran the numbers uh, for Harlem, which is what we call the pick three uh, today, straight in box, you know, yes, they, she, they ran the numbers game, right? And uh, he was her understudy. And, and we can see that in the uh, movie Hootlum. You yes, can sir. see a little bit of how that relationship, but here's what's interesting. They're in production. HBO is in a production right now of doing a series about Madame St. Clair. Mm, and so okay. what we're going to see is a little bit more information about the earlier years of Bumpy coming into play through Madame St. Clair's uh, series that's, get ready, that's in production right now on HBO. Mm. Excellent. Okay, and that's good. And, and my sister Naima said they were agreeing, and th that's going to be a great show. And, and Dr. Carter, what I what my suggestion is for people who question the validity of a show from other people, I feel like you should make your own show. Like if you don't like the way something's being portrayed, then portray it a certain type of way as opposed to complaining. Because then what you going to watch on TV? Because ain't nothing technically ever going to be right. You know what I'm that's saying? That's my <laughs> If you want, uh, you have to understand that uh, history in itself. Can be boring. <laughs> Bumpy didn't have that type of action every day of his life. There's some days Bumpy sat at home and watched television, right? Yes, sir, yes, sir, There's yes, some sir. days they went on vacation. In order to keep uh, people interested, they had to incorporate some creative liberty, right? Uh, we don't have any transcripts of what happened in the Mars at, at, at a person probably getting time out at that time. We don't have any, but you can fill in based on research and development and fill in the gaps with what you think is close to history. And plus you got to put in some uh, creative liberty to keep people excited. If you want something to be 100% spot on, that's called a documentary, right? Absolutely. And so then you have to go and do the research. Uh, I think that even if we put on a production, we will have to add some creative liberty to keep people excited. That's just television and entertainment in itself. But, you know, people have to lighten up. Don't sit there and get so caught up in the matrix of television that you be like, oh, my God, they wrong for putting this in there. Well, OK, we know they're wrong. It just leaves room for us to go out there and give the truth to the people. What this does, somebody going to see scenes from the nation and going to want to know more about the nation and going to research it. And that's where we come up to the point and fill the gaps. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Great. And thank everyone for continuing to watch people's podcast. What about the Freedom Riders um, and how that uh, how they went down? I, of course, everybody knows the story of the uh, the three men and how they were, um, you know, murdered. But to see 
the mafia's in, involvement, Bumpy Johnson's involvement with this. These are things I did not know. What do you think about that? There has always been a good, uh, 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 love hate relationship between the mafia and the federal government. It's always been a love hate relationship. Uh, there were certain mandates and things that the federal government had to stay within bounds of. And at that time, you know, under J. Edgar Hoover's uh, FBI, he prided himself with being uh, a stickler for following the rules, right? He was very on that. So they wouldn't go into those gray areas, but they they did go to the mob for many things to, to work outside of the law on their behalf. I and mean, we've seen this in the Cuban... Cuban Missile Crisis, yes, where they had the mafia involved in helping to bring some resolution down there with the Cuban Missile Crisis. So it is not far-fetched to believe that the mafia could have been involved in getting intel for the government uh, through a black art type of situation. Uh, so, you know, it's more than feasible that that can be happening. Could that have been some creative liberty? Absolutely. But it is plausible uh, that the mafia was involved in helping the federal government to get intel and to do things that they could not do because of the laws, right? So I, I think it's plausible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I do as well. Uh, there's also a video game called Mafia 3, random, but Mafia 3 was about a black man and his journey and how he worked with the mafia and how they had the the government, the mafia, like all, everybody was in, and it was a black man and his, it's all, it's, it's one of my favorite games of all time, but it it showed that through the eyes of a historical thing back in the sixties, but it showed like, maybe they are, maybe they all were working together. Maybe they on certain details that everybody couldn't go into certain areas. So it's possible. Um, one last point, Dr. Carter, the umbrella in the shower with the mafia man and how his wife and how he played, uh, you know, crazy or was playing crazy so he can get off. Uh, I thought that was funny. What'd you think about that? That's uh, based on a historical fact. Uh, mm. uh, and so that actually occurred uh, uh, in the movie, in the TV show Sopranos where uh, Junior, the uncle of yes, uh, Tony <laughs> Soprano played that same Role, yes, like he was, you know, yes, uh, mentally challenged. Yes, sir. Well, that that actually occurred. That's that's a real event that actually occurred for that person. If mm. he really did that, uh, mm. to to try to lessen it, lessen that. So, uh, you know, they spot on with that. It's tied to historical events. That's that's spot on. That's good. And also, his wife, uh, you know, the mother of the uh, the daughter, you know, who's dating the black, the black, the black guy. She's from the Sopranos, you know what I'm saying? So that's yeah. Uh, so it just made it even more better. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I want to thank you very much, Dr. Carter, for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on the People's Podcast. I can't wait to put this on YouTube, and I can't wait if, if you know if if you may come back towards once the once the new season comes on, so we can recap what what happens in the new season as well. Absolutely, yeah. man. It's a plum pleasing pleasure, and I encourage everyone to watch the show. And then to go research some of the events. Uh, history is best qualified to reward all those who research. And so uh, look for the historical accuracies that's on the show and then dive deeper into what went on in Harlem at that time because it really set the stage across the country within the Black community. Great, great. Thank you very much to one of my uh, mentors and just a great friend and, and brother, Dr. Henry M. Carter. All right, assalamu alaikum, sir. Well, alaikum salam. Thank you all for watching. Boom. Um.